Welcome back to the immunology series. Now, in this seventh lecture, we are going to look at humoral immunity. Specifically, we're going to look at the two different ways in which B cells are activated, and also look at the roles of B cells and antibodies in an immune response. So when we are looking at humoral immunity, we are looking at circulating antibodies in the serum or in the blood or in the lymph. So we call it humoral, means fluid. Just a little bit reminder from earlier lectures, B cells originate and mature fully in the bone marrow, unlike a T cell where they need to be uh, gain maturity in the thymus. Now, B cells carry membrane-bound immunoglobulins, abbreviated as MIG, on their surface that bind and recognize antigens. Now, when B cells are activated, they will differentiate into plasma cells. The main thing about plasma cells is that they can secrete soluble forms of immunoglobulin, referred to as antibodies, all right, or IgEs. Now, B cells have a greater diversity than T cells, meaning that they can recognize surface elements of a complete biological macromolecules. So if you recall from last lecture, I emphasized on the term peptides that T cell receptors can only recognize peptides. But unlike T cell receptors, both membrane-bound immunoglobulin and soluble immunoglobulins are not limited to peptide recognitions. They can also bind to carbohydrates and lipid. That's why I put a star there. The last time we talked about how CD4 Th2 helper cells can activate B cells. Now, in fact, B cells itself can act as an antigen presenting cell. Now, here in the graph here showing that the membrane bound immunoglobulins can bind to an extracellular pathogen and then bring into the vesicle where they get degraded, and the degradation small peptide can bind or interact with the MHC class 2 and get presented that way to the CD4 Th2 helper cells. And in that sense, uh, th through this pathway, B cells can be activated. Now, in the last slide, we bring in T cells in the picture. Now, that means that there is some type of a thymus dependent uh, mechanisms there. And you guess it right. When we have thymus dependent, we also have a way to activate B cells without the thym thymus, so thymus independent, and we'll come back to that. So first, let's look at the thymus dependent pathway. Now, a little bit recap from last lecture there, uh, we have T cells activations by dendritic cells or macrophages serving as antigen presenting cell. So it's synapse on the Th0 cells, and it can differentiate into either um, Th1 or Th2. Now, when there is in the um, Th2 pathway, we just talked about how B cells itself can serve as an antigen presenting cell, and we synapsed on Th2, and uh, through this pathway, the B cells can be activated. Now, notice that when we are talking about MHC class either one or two, uh, when they are processing antigens, only peptides undergoes those processing. So in a sense that both B cells and T cells may be acting against the same pathogen in general, but can recognize very different specific components of that pathogen. Now let's take a closer, deeper look of the thymus-dependent activations of B cells. So it required Th2 helper cells. So now the process is initiated by antigen uh, binding to the uh, membrane-bound immunoglobulin. And there here you have the synapse between the Th2 helper cells to the B cells. So we have our typical antigen or peptide presented on the MX2. A C class 2 uh, and, and bind to our T cell receptors and along with the CD4 co receptor that are interacting with the MHC class 2. Now, the next phase of this interaction is having something called CD40 ligand being secreted from the Th2 helper cell. 
and that CD40 ligand bind to CD40 receptor that is located on the B cells. Now, CD40 ligand is actually something that is related to TNF-alpha, and when this binding happens, it will drive the B cell cycles and expressions of B7, uh, which is required for co-stimulations and interaction with the CD28 that is on T cells. So after all of these interactions happens in this immunological synapse, uh, cytokines will be uh, released, okay, secreted by Th2 helper cells, uh, such as IL-4, IL-5, IL-6, and uh, activate the B cells, and then B cells will proliferate and differentiate. What we've just looked at was thymus-dependent activations of B cells. Now we're looking at thymus-independent activations of B cells. Now in this case, there is no MHC class 2 molecule involved. So in this independent pathway, we are going to be able to recognize different antigens, including lipids and carbohydrate antigens. So for this things to happen, there are two signals to, required for activations. So the graph here illustrated there is a pathogen and there are some perhaps lipid and car carbohydrate moiety on its pathogen surface. So there should be some type of an initial binding to membrane-bound immunoglobulins. Now, in addition to that, it also needs co-stimulations by additional antigen bindings to uh, receptors that are not very specific, pretty general, such as LPS receptors, TOLA receptors, and scavenger receptors. These receptors, in addition to being located on macrophages, they are also located on B cells as well. Now, after these two stimulations happen, meaning the stimulations of a membrane-bound immunoglobulin in addition to other pattern recognition receptors that are located on the B cells, some cross-linking will happen. The cross-linking will form between those multiple membrane-bound immunoglobulin uh, molecules and other receptors. So that is the process leading to its thymus-independent activations of B cells. Activations of B cells will lead to differentiation into plasma cells, and plasma cells is going to uh, secrete uh, soluble immunoglobulins or antibodies. And here are the two figures or two illustrations that uh, depict the classical way that we draw uh, immunoglobulins. Um, so here on the um, left hand side here, we have the green yellow. Uh, antibody structures. So the color illustrated the center uh, chain that is in green is so-called heavy chain. So it's really a bigger piece of uh, um, you know, uh, proteins there. Yeah. And on the outside is the light chain. So um, in between those connections are disulfide bonds. Now, usually the end terminal is where the um, binding happens to antigens, okay, the variable regions as well. So on the flip side here, on the right hand side, it shows you the red regions indicating variable regions, meaning they vary depending on the antigen that is binding, right? So antigen binding sites are located on the end terminal. So that's the um, sort of the uh, protein breakdown uh, you know, characterizations of the antibody structure. Now we have also we also have other ways to look at its structure. So the whole piece of uh, you know on the the handles of the Y shape, okay, that we call a fab fragment, okay, and the uh, strict part of the antibody, the vertical part, uh, we call it the FC part, okay. Now another way also to uh, to you know, complete the whole picture is that uh, the antibodies, the tips are changing, but the rest of it uh, in blue color are constant regions, so they don't change uh, at all. In terms of the types of antibodies, uh, there are five major classes or isotypes that is defined by the uh, constant region of 
or the FC regions. There are IgM, IgG, IgD, IgA, and IgE. Now, certainly there are also other subclasses within each class, and that is beyond the scope of this lecture. We have something called IgG1, IgG4, and etc. Now, when we look at IgM, okay, IgMs are those that are presented on the B cell surface. Now, when it is being secreted, it is usually the first immunoglobin being secreted by plasma cells, and they can form a pentamer shape, so they can, you know, group together with, uh, in number of five. And IgG is usually the second one that is secreted after IgM, after a process called isotype switching. We'll look at it later. And that's considered about the majority, about 75 of the soluble antibodies are IgG. Now, IgD can also co-express with IgM and, uh, on the B cell surface. And in terms of IgA, they are majorly present in tear, saliva, mucus, milk, and mucosal tissues. They serve as a surveillance function. And lastly, IgE, they are usually involved in uh, allergic reactions. So how do antibodies work to defend against an infection? Now, so here is the five or actually six major breakdowns of its mechanism of actions, including neutralization, opsonization, agglutination, precipitation, lysis, and complement activations. And we'll look at some of those in greater details. But in brief, here is the breakdown neutralizations. We're talking about neutralizing the toxic side of an antigen. Opsonizations is coating the pathogen surface. And agglutinations is clumping larger particles together by antigen antibodies, and precipitation is complexing soluble antigens and antibodies and bring it out, you know, from solution and precipitate it out. And lysis is involved in direct attack of cellular membranes and complement activation. We've actually looked at it before, and we'll look at it briefly as a review later. So let's first look at antibody-mediated neutralization. Now, neutralizing antibodies seems to be a buzzword in the last two years or so since uh, a vaccine rolled out. Anyhow, now antibodies uh, that can do neutralization, what they do is usually they block up virus binding to cell receptors, and uh, this mechanism effectively stops viral to gain entry into our cells and that is on the virus side now in terms of bacteria these antibodies can also block the bacterial colonizations by basically uh, blocking something called adhesin that is on the surface of bacteria so that they are not sticky on our um, epithelial surface so that they cannot colonize and reproduce now these days, you may also hear something called mucosal protections, right? Mucosal protections. Now mucosal protections against a pathogen or infectious agents are usually uh, achieved through immunoglobulin A or IgA. Remember, they are located in some of those fluid and also in mucosal tissues. And let's look at this examples here. Now, um, this IgA, when it is in the mucosal tissues, they are in a dimeric form, meaning they form uh, like a like a double mer, like a like a dimer. Okay. So here is an example of uh, a strep throat. Okay, strep throat. It, uh, is caused by the bacteria Streptococcus pyogenes, and this uh, Streptococcus pyogenes have uh, other antigens, or that is on the surface, and other virulence factors. And one of the uh, most important virulence factors uh, that is on strept pyogenes is something called F protein. Now, this F protein on the bacteria can actually uh, have the ability to attach to to something called uh, fibronectin, fibronectin that is uh, in the extracellular matrix in the body. Now, the fibronectin I didn't draw on the figure. Now, by binding between F protein and fibronectin, it can actually uh, let the bacteria to gain food, gain uh, adhesions and colonize, and leading to uh, potentially strep throat. 
Now, when there is IgA that can recognize or that can bind to F protein, uh, this IgA will effectively uh, block this adhesion process so that our cilia can come into actions and sweep the bacteria to the gut and then preventing from uh, it to overdevelop or to, for it to reproduce so its population is under control and therefore there will be no strep throat development here is a table from a textbook it's just for your information now in addition to a whole organism a whole virus a whole bacteria uh, that can you know become violence and cause disease and we have corresponding neutralizing antibodies that can neutralize them uh, antibodies or neutralizing antibodies can also bind to secreted factors many of those are toxins or exotoxins that are secreted by uh, bacteria and when you have a neutralizing antibody that are specific for these uh, toxins you can also effectively neutralize them and uh, prevent these uh, violence factors to cause damage uh, uh, in our cells and here is just a graphical image to recap what I just said. Many pathogens, particularly bacteria, can secrete toxic proteins or toxins, and it can cause cell death, you know, including our human cells and as well as commensal organisms, meaning the normal floras. And when you have antibodies that can target these toxins, it can protect the cells by blocking and binding to these toxins. Next is antibody-mediated opsonization, where we've looked at this before during our talks in the complement system. Now let's have a recap. Now actually, one of the most important functions of IgG antibodies is to perform opsonization. Now the variable regions in the FAP fragment of the antibodies can bind to antigens on the pathogen surface. And the FC regions, okay, the stick part, okay, of the antibodies can actually bind to the FC receptors on macrophage surface. And cross-linking between FC receptors can activate receptor-mediated endocytosis and facilitate the whole process to break down uh, whole pathogens. Now let's look at antibody-mediated cytotoxicity. Now we've just looked at how uh, FC receptors uh, are located on macrophages. And in addition to that, FC receptors also can be found on NK cells or cytotoxic T cells. And here the illustrations is look at how FC receptors are located on NK cells. So the FC receptor will bind to the FC region of the antibody and the variable regions in the FAP fragment will bind to the uh, recognizable peptide that is presented on a sick cell. Okay, sick cell here means uh, usually we're talking about viral infected cells and it's displaying foreign proteins on its surface. Uh, now through this manner, it will stimulate NK cell innate based response to release perforin granzymes to kill the viral infected cells. And this same mechanism can also help recruit cytotoxic T cells and do cell media immunity through a very similar fashion and here we will have a review all right a review of antibody mediated activations of complement cascade so here you have a little bit more context now compared to a couple of weeks ago now we have antibodies that can bind to antigens of the pathogen surface and complement C1 can actually bind to the antibodies forming a complex and this C1 antibody complex will serve as a convertase which cut complement C4 and C2. Now the pieces of the C4 and C2, C4B and C2, 2A will form a new complex to uh, serve as a C3 convertase and in this manner this C3 convertase will activate C3 and trigger all these three effector branches of the complement cascade. 
So the three cascade is the classical pathway leading to opsonizations and phagocytosis. It can also help agglutinations, meaning, you know, clumping the surface of the organisms and also lead to inflammatory effects uh, such as chemotaxis through C5A. And lastly, but not least, is the formation of the membrane attack complex, uh, the combinations of uh, multiple complement factors, C5B, 6, 7, 8, and 9, and leading to ruptures of cellular membrane via pore formation. There's additional effect to antibody-based opsonization. Now, when it is working on the pathogens, it can also work hand-in-hand, hand, actually synergized, so enhanced effect with C3B or complement-mediated opsonizations. So the figure here shows you when you have both of these opsonins that are coating the pathogen surface, it will greatly enhance or facilitate the phagocytosis process and the eventual destruction of the pathogen. So we've just looked at the major functions of immunoglobulins or antibodies. Now let's look at the order of their emergence. Like I said earlier, IgM is the first soluble antibody that is being released. And actually when you need to have isotype switching between IgM to IgG, T helper cells, and in particular, TH2 helper cells interactions with the B cells is necessary for that to occur. So the illustration shows you how TH2 helper cells uh, synapse onto the B cells and activate it, and afterward the B cells perform isotype switching and turn into plasma cells that can secrete IgG. And while the immune response is in progress, initially the bonding or the recognitions between the existing antibodies and the target antigens are usually not that strong. But through mechanisms such as somatic hypermutations, um, the DNA is going to have a nucleotide substitutions that changes the uh, code for the variable or the antigen binding regions and through this process it will lead to stronger bond formation between the antibodies and the target and resulting in a much uh, better antibodies. Now this mechanism we'll talk about it in later lectures. Now let's take a deeper look at the isotype switching process. Like I said earlier, soluble IgM, IgA, IgG are main antibodies that can be found in different locations of the uh, body fluids, and more specifically, IgG can be found in these um, tears, saliva, mucus, and as well as in the mucosal tissues to mount a very uh, strong neutralization actions during early encounters of the pathogen. Now, the initial response of activated plasma cells, again, we've looked at it, initially secrete IgM in a pentamer form and a very small quantity of IgD. And after this isotype switching process, it will secrete IgG, IgA in addition to a smaller amount of IgM. So it turns out that the process or the mechanisms for isotype switching is exactly look like how uh, thymus dependent activations of B cells happens. So you require the same type of interactions. Okay, you, we have uh, uh, the peptide being displayed on MHC class 2, CD4 interactions with MHC class 2, and as well as having the CD40 ligand being secreted by TH2 helper cell and bind to CD40 receptors that is located on the B cells and through all these uh, initiations of uh, from cytokines, IL-4, 5, 6, and will stimulate the whole isotype switching process. So the overall big picture here is that the CD4 uh, 40 ligand and interactions with the CD40 uh, is actually necessary for this isotype switching process to happen.
So now let's have a summary of different antibody functions by isotype. Now I circled a few of those that is more notable. Um, first, we can look at uh, IgM and IgG. Now IgM and IgG, they are more located in the lymph node and as well as in spleen. Now, most of the time when we have IgM, that's usually the beginning of the infection stage and it will switch to IgG later on. Now, in terms of IgA, which I circled it there, it's one thing to be very important to be noted is that uh, IgM, when it switched to IgA, and IgA, this dimer form is actually uh, essentially important in mucosal defense because compared to the rest of those uh, common Ig, like IgG and IgD, only IgA can transport across epithelium and provide mucosal defense. And that's why this has been a buzz in the discussions in terms of the um, current pandemic that we are having. Now, the lastly, but it's also very important, is IgE. Now, IgE, uh, notice that it has a huge role or major role in sensitizations of mast cell. So it has a uh, essential role in hypersensitivity or allergic reaction, which we'll talk about in later lectures or in the immunology series. Now let's look at this huge graph as a summary of humoral immunity. Now remember when we look at humoral immunity, uh, we are not totally ignoring the innate immune response. So let's look at the sequence of events here. Now number one here, we are showing a typical innate response where macrophage engulf extracellular pathogens and then process it through uh, MHC class two and display it on the surface and synapse on T naive helper cell, TH0. And on the other hand, naive B cells can also perform antigen presenting by binding to extracellular uh, pathogens and then engulfed and again doing going through a very similar process where the peptide are being uh, presented on MHC class 2 at two TH uh, naive cells as well. Now TH naive uh, TH zero cells or naive cells uh, can uh, break or differentiate into TH1 and TH2, which we talked about in the previous lecture. Now, TH1 has a role in activating macrophage, and TH2 has a role in activating the B cells. Uh, now, there's a fine balance uh, between TH1 and TH2. I didn't include it here, uh, but we know that it happens. So moving on to the side of the B cells activations. Now after activations, the B cells will differentiate into plasma cells where it can actively secrete antibodies that can uh, neutralize some of these uh, extracellular pathogens and come back to a loop of it. You know, back to the innate part is that antibodies can serve as a obstinance that can coat the bacterial surface and have a uh, antibody dependent opsonizations and leading to phagocytosis. And here I'm showing macrophage have, has these uh, FC receptors that can interact with the uh, FC regions of the antibodies. Well, number nine, looping back, is that uh, uh, naive B cells can then also differentiate into memory B cells where it will remember uh, the uh, antigens having this specific membrane-bound immunoglobin that can later on in life come back and uh, f fairly quickly to recognize this same pathogen again. Since we wrap up that last slide with talking about memory B cells and let's have a look at the persistence of memory. Now, both naive T cells and B cells will encounter antigens. And the primary response that we've been looking at in the two lectures is that uh, they're going to differentiate into something called armed effector cells, okay? And T cells can become uh, cytotoxic T cells and also become uh, 
Th1, Th2 helper cells that can stimulate macrophages and also stimulate B cells. Now, effector T cells after the primary response will die off, but plasma cells and antibodies can, uh, you know, be in circulation for months to years after an acute infection, and it really depends on. Uh, what type of infections you're talking about? So it does vary from disease to disease. Uh, uh, its effect. Now, and after this primary response, it will also produce memory B cells and T cells. Now, these are long-lived cells that can retain immunocompetency, and this process usually occur about five days or so into the course of the infections. And immunological memory can last for life, and because of the persistence of memory, it leads to a stronger and faster secondary immune response than the primary. And the secondary response is predominantly involving memory B cells and T cells and antibodies. Now, here is a、uh, table that、uh, comparing. The, or contrasting the differences between、uh, a vaccine being a、uh, primary response versus secondary response. So in one column here, we are looking at. Unimmunized, so someone haven't got a given vaccine, and then having a first dose leading to primary response. Now, usually at the beginning of that, the specific B cells for that given antigens in the vaccines are low. Okay, and most of the antibodies, you know, from that stage would be IgM with a little bit IgG. And also, initial antibody affinities would be low, and somatic mutations would be low. But after this priming dose, the secondary response in a already immunized patients or individuals would have more specific B cells because of memory that were created from the first dose, and primarily we will have IgG. Now, in terms of IgA responses, it really depends on The type of vaccinations and where that type of immune response are stimulated. If it is a mucosal vaccine, it is likely to induce IgA presence in the mucosal tissues. Now, at the secondary response, the antibody affinity would be high, and also went through a lot of somatic mutation to achieve this high affinity or strong binding between the antibody and the antigen. So after last lecture and this lecture, here is a nice time to have a summary of both the intracellular antigens and extracellular antigens. Now here again is a graph showing you how intracellular antigens are being processed, and these proteins are being chopped up. By proteasomes and present via MHC class one and activate、uh, cytotoxic T cells for largely cell mediated immune response. Now notice that Th1 cells also、uh, greatly amplify T cytotoxic T cells as well through interleukin two, and as well as activating macrophages. So on the other side of the story, we have extracellular antigens. Mostly, we are referring to bacteria at this point. Now, it is being engulfed by antigen-presenting cells such as macrophages or dendritic cells, and the peptide pieces are being processed and presented via MHC class II. Now, it can activate Th or T helper cells, and in this branch here, I'm illustrating how it goes to the Th. Two and mostly for、uh, humoral or antibody-mediated immune response.、Uh, this is through IL-4 stimulations. So we've basically learned the basic mechanisms of cellular response and humoral response between the last lecture and this lecture. Now it wouldn't be、uh, hurtful or it would be helpful to do a little bit exercise. For yourself, and to、uh, just to draw some flowchart to illustrate how the body defends against bacteria, 
versus how it defends against virus. Now notice here I'm mostly focusing or treating bacteria as an extracellular uh, pathogen and we're treating viruses as mostly an intracellular pathogen. So, uh, you know, think about that, draw some flowchart that would be helpful to consolidate your memory. Well, that is all for this lecture and I'll see you next time. Thank you.